<clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to Thursday. This is week two of uh, <clears throat> 15 minutes in the Word. And of course, we're using this time uh, to prepare our hearts for Easter. So during the Easter season, uh, we've been talking about the life that Christ lives, uh, the death that he died. And uh, during Resurrection Week, we'll talk about the gift that he gives through his resurrection. Uh, so this is uh, week two. We've been talking about the death he died. And, and just to remind you that these are more than just simply historical events. Uh, and even a phenomenal historical event in the resurrection, these events each have an impact on our life because he lived the life that we could never live, and through his obedience, uh, we receive the righteousness of God. He died the death that we should have died, and his death is counted as a punishment for our sins so that our sins are forgiven through his death. And his resurrection uh, is the hope of new life that we have in him, so he was raised to life so that we might have new life. Uh, this week, as we're uh, covering the cross of Christ, <clears throat> we're coming to a very practical passage in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, matter of fact, Paul is using big guns here. He's talking about, you know, people who are having a hard time agreeing within the fellowship. And the theology that he uses is the cross. It is the very marker of our agreement and the attitude that we should have in our relationship to one another. So before we read the passage, why don't we uh, go to the Heavenly Father in prayer? And then we'll read the passage and dive in together. By the way, we have Katie back from being a stay-at-home mom. Welcome back. In a stay-at-home time when we're all stay-at-home. So it's good to have Katie back with us uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the beauty of your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us so clearly, so powerfully, so beautifully. We thank you that as we read the word, our hearts are mirrored in it, and we see ourselves, but we thank you beyond that. We see the image of Christ Jesus and the vision of what you created us to be and have recreated us to be in him. Father, as we read today, may you encourage us and comfort us, convict us, and give us hope. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Sorry for my voice. This is actually uh, after our Sunday morning service uh, that we're recording this, so I've already uh, kind of talked my voice out. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, any comfort from his love, if any uh, common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy be complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Your relationships with one another should have the same mindset as that in Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And we've been going through the rhythm in these uh, devotional times of looking at what the passage reveals about the heart of God in Christ Jesus, uh, then we look at how the passage reflects who we are, what it reveals about us, our insecurities, our fears, uh, the things that, that we bring to life. And then, of course, we always want to look at a passage and how it calls us to respond to the invitation that Jesus has given us to know him, walk him, with him, to have, find our comfort in him. So, guys, as you look at this uh, passage from a high level, and while I get a sip of coffee to recover my voice here, what are, what are some of the things, how are you seeing the heart of the Father reflected in the person of Jesus? I mean, the thing that grabbed me right from the start is, is in verse 7. He made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And that being the sovereign God doing that, that sovereign God became a servant um, and took on that nature. And so that's just amazing to me. So even, obviously, as this passage is talking about humility, um, to see that level of humility, knowing that it's never been reached before. This is the greatest example of humility ever. Um, and that's very humbling, really. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you're coming, you know, from verse 6, uh, where it's talking about the uh, incarnate Christ uh, existing in the very nature of God. Everything that God uh, God is, he, he was. 
And uh, he didn't think of it as something that he had to hang on to. Uh, it's kind of a tricky little translation, you know, of the Greek there. Uh, it, it has you know, the idea of somebody just hanging on to something relentlessly and they, uh, they won't let go. Maybe you've seen, you know, kids fight over a toy where they're each, you know, kind of pulling it in one direction. Uh, or maybe you've seen adults fight over something. But anyway, even more simple and less profound. When we have rights, we, we hang on to them. He, he let go of them in order, you know, to be a servant. And this is how he saw himself. You know, he says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So this isn't just something where, you know, Paul's reflecting on it later and, and you know, changing course and saying, oh, let me show you how humble Jesus is. This is how Jesus saw himself as well as a servant. Yeah. Uh, which is absolutely, and, and of course, what he portrayed in the upper room in the night before his crucifixion, uh, where uh, all the disciples came in, and of course, uh, the least among the disciples should have washed the feet of all the other disciples. Uh, but they're arguing about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and the greatest in the kingdom of heaven took off his outer cloth. He wrapped a cloth around his waist, he poured a basin of water, and, and he washed the, their feet. And John has this beautiful picture, the way that he frames that. Having loved his own in this world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He, he washed their dirty feet, and then he went to the cross, and he died for them. Oh, I love um, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, um, we get encouragement from Christ. We get comfort from his love. And um, we get tenderness and compassion. Oh, yeah. Those are huge. Uh, and, and, of course, Paul is using hyperbole here. Of, of, of course you have encouragement from being united with Christ. Of course you've received comfort in his love. And, of course, you've, you have the common sharing of the Holy Spirit or fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Might even be a better way to translate that. Of course you've received tenderness and compassion from him. And, and these are the very things we've received from Christ we, we ought to give to one another. Uh, as he gave to Christ. <laughs> really what Paul is you know, doing here is, uh, toward the end of the book, he said, I plead with Yodia and sent to to agree with each other. And this is the basis of their agreement. It's not that their theology had to be exact, and it's not you know, that uh, they had to agree about uh, you know, how to arrange you know, the furniture in the house church or any of those other things. Our agreement is on something much bigger, much deeper, much more profound that wipes away all of our differences, and that's encouragement and compassion you know, that we have in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I think we also see um, the exaltation of Christ at, at the end of that, that he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And you fast forward to Revelation, you know, and you see every knee bowing, you know, every, every people from every language and tribe and tongue you know, exalting Jesus. And, and so we see... You know, the humble Savior who, who was a servant you know, died on a cross, but, but he's been exalted, yeah. and he will be exalted. I was thinking about this this week because you always make fun of me. We do our Easter series, and uh, usually as soon as Easter's over, I go out of town to be with my grandkids. Uh, so for the last three years, Matt has preached a sermon on the exaltation, which is the Sunday after Easter. So I was thinking about that all week, but you, you got it in. You got it. You, yeah. you got your message of exaltation sermon. in. Which is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely perfect. I love, um, you know, uh, verse six. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something that that he would take advantage of. Uh, rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance you know, as as a man. He humbled himself by coming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I remember. Uh, when I was in seminary, as a young seminary student, uh, uh, my Greek uh, professor was a guy by the name of Virtus Gideon. Uh, what a cool name. Unforgettable. Yeah. I mean, and he, was, he was just a virtuous, godly man. And he was reading through this passage from us in, in the Greek. And he had to stop, and he pulled off his glasses, and his glasses were kind of fogged up, and he, and he wiped them off, and he began to weep uh, as he read this. And he said, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, a cross kind of death. In other words, it wasn't just him giving himself over to death. It was a horrific death and, and deeply moving. And in that one move, you see both the love and justice of God, 
uh, the justice and the horrors of sin being you know punished and, and, and the love and the self-sacrifice of himself so that we might have our sins forgiven such a beautiful picture uh, the second movement that we usually try to do when we're reading the word is you know how do we see ourselves reflected in this um, you know where does it mirror us and uh, reveal you know our, our our fears our insecurities our weaknesses so how do you see yourself mirrored in this in this text I think I just see how um, how much we need unity um, in that first paragraph excuse me um, yeah we just see that we need to be like-minded um, Verse 2, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, and do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And uh, we see the humility of Jesus in that next movement. And, and as we read it, I'm just thinking about how his humility and sacrifice has united us with God and how our humility can unite us with, with those around us um, in his power. And I just think in this time where we're at right now, um, where you know people are hoarding supplies and um, people are trying to just take care of myself, we're also seeing others humbling themselves and, and offering what they have to those around them. And we're seeing the power of that. And I think, I mean, the humility that we see in Christ, hopefully, we can see him working that out in us, and that affects how we handle this whole situation, how we care for those around us in this situation, and uh, it's just really encouraging to me. Yeah, it, it's, you know, um, uh, we, where we do see ourselves is we do act in our own self-interest. Uh, even the, you know, the most uh, outwardly humble things we do sometimes are, you know, kind of guarded, you know, by self-interest and uh, wanting others to see us as being humble and, and, and those, you know, and those kinds of things. And of course, uh, the beauty of this passage is that we've had somebody else uh, look out for our interest, which frees us up to invest in the interest of others. Uh, we're secure because he has, he is the one looking out for us and he has called us uh, to do the same, you know, uh, for others. So if you see yourself, you know, you, you know, mirrored in this is probably, you know, going to those last few verses. Um, we want to be exalted without humility. Uh, and, of course, it was his humility, you know, allowed him to be exhausted. And, of course, uh, exhausted, exalted. <laughs> I told you, it's just after the Sunday morning service. It, it all, and, and Peter would, you know, say the same thing, you know, he'd say the same thing, you know, God opposes the power or the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the hand of God, that He may lift you up in due time. And, and of course, you see this model, you know, in our Savior. So, how do we respond, you know, to what we see of Christ and what we see of ourselves in this passage? I mean, for me, one of the initial responses is is repentance. You know, um, obviously, I feel like my default mode is so often the opposite of what Paul is calling the church to be here. I often want to exalt myself, look to my needs, look to my interests, and then maybe if I have time, I'll consider the needs and interests of others, or if I have resources. Um, but honestly, the, when he goes on to describe Christ and his humility, that, that grabs my heart, oh, and yeah. that causes me to realize I am not often humble, and I want to be, and so I need to repent of my pride, repent of my selfishness, and repent of my kind of just keeping things closed right now yeah. to others. And I want to display this Christ to yeah. my city so, and my family. You know, so for us, being a servant is something we occasionally do. Uh, you know, out of, out of you know, out of the wild. You know, living for ourselves and our own self interest. You know, the accumulation of time and stuff, and all those other things. And oh yeah, I'm going to go for 15 minutes and serve here, or 15 minutes and serve there. For us, you know, being a servant is something we sometimes do. For him, it is something he was. Uh, the very essence of his character was self-giving and, and giving himself and for others. I think for me, um, it's looking to Jesus not only as my example, which he is an amazing example. By re You read this passage and he's a wonderful example, but also looking to him 
to be the one who does the work in yeah. me as well. And it's not like, oh, let me watch and see what he did and I'll emulate that, but asking him to do that work in me um, and constantly oh, yeah. seeking him. And, and, um, and Paul's going to follow this up by saying, work out your salvation in fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you both to will and act according to his good pleasure. And he is the one who gives us a heart to be a servant. He is the one who enables us to be a servant. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have emptied yourself and became a servant. You, you washed dirty feet. You fed people who were hungry. Uh, you looked with compassion on those who were ill. And Father, we, we thank you for everything that you have done. We thank you that you humbled yourself to a cross kind of death. And we thank you that you did that for us. And of course, Father, may we revel in the encouragement we have from being united with you, the comfort we have in your love, uh, the fellowship brought about by the Holy Spirit, and the tenderness and compassion we receive from you. May our joy be complete in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.